before you today are the ethnographers involved in the Highland Story Project. But what exactly is the Highland Story Project? Well, it is a mission to report the unreported. Too often, the Highland area is seen through the lens of statistics and crime rates, and not through the lens of culture, history, and diversity that it deserves. The Highland Story Project is also an opportunity. It is a chance to discover the depth of the community, working with its people to uncover their beliefs, their values, and their stories. The Highland Story Project is also a dedication. It is a commitment to unearthing the multifaceted personalities of both the neighborhood and its people. It is a project of communication, of observation, and of stories. Stories told by us. So for this project, students of Professor Galeris's Challenge Track course were asked to go to research sites within the community. We were then responsible for collecting primary research through observations and through conducting formal and informal interviews. We were then responsible for analyzing this data in order to discover primary research elements and folklore patterns, and we then conducted secondary research in order to contextualize these findings. Before any of this research began, however, we all went in with initial assumptions and opinions that were largely transformed due to the insight provided to us both by community members and our individual experiences of visiting our sites. Now, all the research sites were diverse ranging from tattoo parlors to cat rescues to parks, so much more. But it soon became clear that there were overlapping folklore elements and patterns that were prevalent throughout all the research. For example, the content category of arts found self-expression to be a primary component of their sites. The content categories of both food and parading found tradition to be primary elements of their sites. But all the content categories found a value on community growth, community togetherness, and social interaction. And this is the heart of Highlands, a community built in diversity that finds strength in its willingness to be cohesive. And so with that, I will now give the floor to our first ethnographer and our first speaker, Ms. Lauren Tuggle. Hi, my name is Lauren Tuggle. I was the leader of the arts content category. Um, throughout this project, we discovered through interviews, through secondary research, through primary research, that art is an extremely <laughs> prolific scene here in Highland. Uh, we, we interviewed artists such as tattoo and piercing artists from our sites and a local folk artist who has her own gallery in the area. We, before this project, did not realize just how deep the roots of art run in the Highland area but our views of the area as a whole have been transformed and I was very glad to participate in this project. I'm Lauren Tuggle, my research site was Right Handed Tattoo Parlor. That's Maddie Brown, whose research site was the Bertha Harris Folk Art Gallery and Marcus Thomas, whose research site was Skinworks Tattoo Parlor. Hi, I'm Maddie Brown and like she said, my site was the Bertha Harris Folk Art Gallery. It's a small gallery located on King's Highway, which is the Yellow House, which is actually her house that she has open to the public for people to come and view her art. Through her art, she paints her childhood and her experiences and her heritage as to encourage the younger generation to embrace their heritage and to learn more about it and express it through themselves. Most of her visitors are actually tourists instead of people from the community, and she wants people to go more from the community to come and view her art because she believes art brings people together and she wants to bring the community together through her art. She also attends the Red River Revival every year, which is where she got her start seven years ago. And she also has a biography about like her past and stuff that's happened to her called The Courage to Rise Again, A Journey from Tears to Testimony, which is an interesting read, and I encourage people to read it. Hello, my name is Marcus Thomas. I was the ethnographer for Skinworks Tattoo Parlor, which is located on East Kings Highway across from the Klein Dormitory here on St. Mary's campus. So being a native of Shreveport, Louisiana, we learn and hear so much about the Highland area from news stories about gun violence or drug activity to where it becomes a scary place. So when I saw Skinworks, I didn't want to go inside. It personally kind of looked run down and like a dungeon. I was like, ooh, honey, no. Um, but once I walked inside, I was transported into a world of art and creativity with its checkerboard floors and its purple walls, I was just fascinated about how we have this little treasure trove of creativity and inspiration in our area. Sadly, Skinworks does not do tattoos anymore at this location. There's three other locations in the Northwest Louisiana area, but the Shreveport location focuses on piercings now. 
and they pierce anything from your ears all the way to your private areas. So I thought that was interesting. It's the only piercing business in the area that just does piercings also. Um, some fun facts about Skinworks, it used to be a barbecue pit um, and restaurant. So a lot of the co-workers um, and owners will talk about, hey, when are we going to fire the grill back up? And I was like, I don't like barbecue, so I hope not soon. Um, and also, they're a really leader in, um, they support the LGBT community, <laughs> they're an ally for a lot of civil rights civilizations, and they're just really cool people. They're really nice, friendly, and if you just walk in and say, hey, I want this, they won't judge you. They're there to be helpful and kind and just accept you for who you are. A lot of the artists at Skinworks that used to work there were also artists that worked with acrylic, ink, watercolor, and multiple medias of art. So they are true artists inside and out. Hi, once again, I'm Lauren Tuggle. My research site was the Red Handed Tattoo Parlor. Uh, for this project, I was kind of afraid to go inside because I've never been inside a tattoo parlor and the prospect of going in was kind of scary. Uh, but whenever I went inside, they were all just so kind and accommodating. They immediately set me up with an interview uh, to talk about the area. It was started by a local artist. It is the only one of its kind. Um, I think throughout this project, my, my whole view of tattooing in general has really changed because of this whole endeavor. Because it just... It kind of made me want to get a tattoo myself, which is something I've never considered. Um, and so I think this whole project was, was really a, a good transformative experience for all of us. We've all learned more about the art scene here in the Highland area, and we've all sort of come to appreciate all, all forms of art, such as the art that goes on your skin or the art that goes up in a gallery. And um, I would really like to thank Professor Glaros for this whole experience, and I think uh, pictures are worth a thousand words, but Highland's art is worth even more than that. How y'all doing? My name's uh, J-Man Reed. I was the content category leader for food. So um, as we all know, food has a huge impact on any neighborhood or society you enter. You know, um, it really comes down to no one wants to cook every day. You know, that gets tiring. You know, who, who's going to do the dishes? Me. I don't want to do them kind of thing. You know, who wants to go out and go shopping every day for the ingredients? And so in the Highland neighborhood, um, there are many fast food choices. And predominantly, fast food isn't really healthy. So our goal as, as the food section was to really find, you know, options that were more healthy and affordable. And so we really found that the restaurants here in the Highland neighborhood, you know, all have their own identity. You know, they're all very cultural, culturally based and, you know, have strong rooted traditions. And so we have me with Strong Tea Shop, um, it's a diner style restaurant. We have Lizzie Sanders presenting well-fed, a vegan style restaurant. And then we have my um, Ethnic Cosby presenting El Compadre, a Mexican style restaurant. So we'll start off with Ethnic Cosby. <coughs> Hello, I'm Anthony Cosby. My research site was El Compadre, which is down the street. Um, El Compadre is a Mexican restaurant that serves traditional Mexican food and also seafood. Um, when I first heard about El Compadre, I wasn't too pleased from me being from San Antonio. I didn't really think it was going to be the same due to it being in a predominantly African American neighborhood. Um, I noticed when I went there, I noticed some same folklores as they had in San Antonio, which is tradition. Mexican restaurants are commonly known to be family-owned businesses, which El Compadre is as well. Um, when I interviewed the workers and customers in, the, in El Compadre, my thoughts and assumptions had changed drastically. Um, being in El Compadre kind of made me feel comfortable. Like, it was like a home away from home. Um, El Compadre believes that if they uh, pass it down from their families, like generations to generations, that it's going to keep their legacy going. And that's what their main focus is. Uh, when I interviewed two workers, Juan and Pedro, uh, they told me that they love their customers as much as they love the Shreveport community. Another thing El Compadre loves to do is give back. For one, being that their family member is a Centenary alumni, and for the second reason, 
they believe that it's better to give than to receive. Hi, I'm Lizzie Sanders, and my research site was Well Fed, which is a vegan restaurant located on Egan Street. My expectations going in were much different than the outcome. I was expecting most vegans to be impolite and judgmental towards those who do not believe the same things and practice the same things they do. Um, overall, it was a very friendly place. Everybody was super polite. The inside was very friendly, as well as the outside. Um, the development. I interviewed a woman named Lindsay who's the co-owner of the restaurant and she used to be a personal trainer. It's co-owned with her and her best friend who both personal trained together. Um, she was watching a cooking show and came up with the idea to um, open up a restaurant with alternative food sources for those who have dietary restrictions. So um, that was come up with on both fronts so they own that together still and um, Lindsay's been a vegan for over 20 years so she knows a lot about it. Um, the main goal for most vegans is saving the environment as long as their personal health and um, health is improved by vegan diets such as like skin clearing, less bloated, more energy. I interviewed three people and all three of them said the exact same thing about it. Um, the conclusion I came to from my project is that stereotypes are not always accurate and should be overlooked. All right, how y'all doing again? Um, I'm Jay, man, as I said earlier. So I had Strawn's Eat Shop across the street from Klein Dormitory on East Kings Highway. So my initial assumptions going in were, you know, being in my dormitory, being able to look across the street and see Strawn's, you know, it's kind of a, kind of run down on the outside, a little shady looking, you know, the sign's a little rusty, but, so I had two different assumptions. One was that it's probably friendly, you know, it's across the street from a college campus, you know, of course, I expect that college kids love food, so they might go there and try the food all the time. And then my second one was that it might be unfriendly, you know, because it looked run down, shady. I, you know, the, the reputation of the Highland neighborhood, I thought that might, you know, relate to the Strongy Shop location. But, uh, and the fact that, you know, it is a kind of small town diner restaurant. So I thought maybe locals are the only ones kind of welcome. But um, that wasn't at all what I, what I found. You know, they're very friendly. I walked in, asked a bunch of questions. They're, the, the waitress sat down at the table when I asked her to interview. And she was like, yeah, let's do this, you know. And she was all, all about it. And so um, what I found there was that the artwork, huge thing. I mean, you walk in a strong, the first thing I noticed was there's artwork across all the walls, kids, adults, any kind of thing you want to look at. You know, they have Disney princesses, you know, Buzz Lightyear, things like that. And they have baseball players, all kinds of really cool things that I could just sit there and just look at for hours because, you know, there's so much detail put into it. And then um, it's a really peaceful environment. So family and friends, you know, it's a real just kind of, you walk into a restaurant, it's not the hustle and bustle that you kind of expect, you know, where you're saying, excuse me, getting hit by chairs kind of thing, you know, it's, it's spacious, yet, you know, you just enjoy the environment there. It's real family, you know, friendly. And then, um, obviously pie, that's what they're known for is their pie, you know. I mean, I love the strawberry pie. That's why I go there, you know. Chicken fried steak too, but the strawberry pie, you know. And then, um, so how I found this information out was, you know, I interviewed some of the, the staff, the customers. I interviewed some uh, teachers and friends around campus that attend there regularly. And then observations, you know, I was a creepy guy that went into the restaurant, sat down and just kind of looked around for, you know, 30 minutes just to kind of get a feel of the place. And so the contribution that Strong's eShop has to the, the Highland neighborhood is that they provide affordable food, you know, so you can get the, the entree, the dessert, and the appetizer for the same price of a Big Mac combo, you know, so families that may not be able to afford or don't want to go out to eat, you know, eat unhealthy food all the time, go to Strong's, you know, get a combo meal that's healthy, basically. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jerrica Harris, and I'll be introducing myself and also my partner, Brian Barker, and introdu introducing our sites, the Highland Parade, and also the Crew of Highland. Key developments that we used to talk about our site was discussing ideas and experiences that we both have from visiting the parade site. Similar topics that we shared from doing our research included food, foods that were a part of the parade, and traditions of parades that Highland continues to follow to this day. We both conducted primary and secondary research for this process project and also had an opportunity to hold formal and informal <coughs> interviews with people from our site. Brighton is such a huge part of the community. Each year this event continues to bring more and more people in in the community. These people aren't just residents of the Highland area but also from other states and also other parts of surrounding areas of Boja City and Shreveport.
So I had the crew of Highland, and uh, what made my initial assumptions was me going to like the Mardi Gras parade in New Orleans as a kid. So I picked it, the crew of Highland's parade to be like um, a lot of drunk people in the crowd and the crowd going crazy and stuff, but it was nothing like that. It was very family oriented, and I was completely wrong. So the course of this project, um, I tracked a few key findings, which was um, community service, parading, food, and tradition. And the most important was uh, food. So in the parade, there's um, different kinds of foods like spaghetti and meatballs, hot dogs, um, moon pies, pre stuff like that. And sometimes they even throw them at you. So it's just a lot of going on in the parade. Um, the way they contribute to the community is through community service, and they strongly believe in it. So they, they um, are involved in different um, community service activities. So one being a Thanksgiving food bank, which they give back enough uh, food to feed 2,000 families. Um, a sports cup they give back to Bird High School, which um, they allow them to keep 100% of the proceeds. They also, um, they also do renovations to parks. So in Columbia Park, they did renovations for the air pumping system for bicycles, um, the lighting and the electrical system. And um, lastly, they, um, they had Bird Marching Band in the parade and they seen that they um, didn't have enough trumpets for everybody, so they uh, donated enough trumpets so everybody could um, participate in the marching band. And lastly, if you haven't been to the parade, I strongly advise you to go because this is a sight to see. Uh, going into my site, with this being my first parade, I was expecting my site to be filled with predominantly African Americans. I thought I would feel a little unsafe and uncomfortable being at my site with hearing nothing but negative things about the neighborhood. I didn't expect to go into it with a positive attitude. Uh, key findings that I discovered from attending the Highland Parade was I discovered, well, I discovered that just by attending that how important tradition is to the neighborhood. For example, for example, having things like crews and parades seems to be a pretty big deal here. The tradition of throwing Mardi Gras beads didn't surprise me much. Uh, catching bees would definitely be my favorite part of attending the parade. Uh, another tradition that caught my attention would have to be the throwing of food into the crowd because I, I didn't know people did that. <laughs> but they're known for throwing their famous king dogs. One thing that did take me by surprise was the type of music that was being played at the parade because I expected it to be like mainly instruments and stuff just like jazz music and stuff like that, but it was actually more traditional music that people play will play in their cars. Um, a few, few cute developments that I had thinking about my site were things that led me to the way I saw and thought about my site was my overall experience that I had from attending the parade. Everyone there was actually really nice and seemed to be having a good time. And I noticed how family oriented that it seemed to be. So like it was really age appropriate for really everyone and families to come. And this led to a, like a really more positive outlook on my site. Um, site contribution to the site contributions to the Highland community is it provides a way for the community to come together and provide something for the community and also people outside the community to enjoy every single year. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kyla Bartley, and I did research on some services located in Highland, as well as Anthony Castillo and Marcus Powell. Going into this, we had a lot of assumptions that the neighborhood is high crime, low income. I didn't really know what to expect. However, one of our ethnographers, Marcus Powell, was from the area, and he claimed that there was a lot of rich diversity and that we would see it once we finished our project, which we found to be true. I never really thought about service, uh, let alone its prevalency in the Highland community. Through diversity, support, and community cohesion, we were able to see that there are opportunities given to people that might not have had them otherwise. So we found that out with the Highland Center Ministries um, and how they help people, as well as the Volunteers of America, which reach, reaches further than Highland, and then the Renzi Education and Arts Center. Good morning, uh, my name is Anthony Castillo and I had the Highland Center Ministries. And what originally drew me to this uh, site was the word ministries actually. And that's because I have had uh, experience working with my church back home and volunteering through that. And I have had experience working with church politics, the good and the bad. Um, 
my assumption was at first that I would be experiencing mainly the bad side of the church politics. However, I could not have been more wrong. Uh, these people truly care about the community and the people of this community. Uh, and as Kyla said uh, just now, that they provide opportunities for people that they might not have had. And the Highland Center really is about providing stepping stones to get to these opportunities. And through that, they provide a loan program for first-time home buyers. They also have a clothing closet for people of all ages. And it, it, the amount of work that they do for this community is really touching and heartwarming. And it's something that I'm very glad I've gotten to experience. Um, another thing they also do is they help you file your taxes for people that have never filed their taxes before. They have retired uh, IRS workers that will come and just help out for this community. Um, their after school youth program. Um, while these parents are working tirelessly, um, they have children and so these, the, the people of the Highland Center um, uh, take these kids in, they tutor them, they watch them for however long they need to be watched until their parents can come and pick them up. Um, and one of the coolest things that they have um, is the Highland Blessings Dinner, which they have every Thursday night, and it's just a free meal where you get to come and enjoy uh, a family-oriented uh, meal for everyone. And they have servers, and it's just it's a big community dinner, and everyone's bonding and talking, and it's really cool to see. Um, they're always looking for volunteers. I encourage you to go. It's a really beautiful site. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is D or Demarcus Powell, and my ethnographic research site was the Volunteers of America, um, <coughs> located right here in Highland on 458 uh, Herndon Street on the corner of Highland Avenue. Um, forest services go. The Volunteers of America is the service location. Um, and I say that because they pretty much handle everything. Um, and not just everything, but they handle like everywhere for Northern Louisiana and parts of Central Louisiana. And they've been here for almost 100 years and I see them being here for another 100 years. Um, when it comes to who they provide to, their primary focus is disabled vets. And being a native of of Shreveport and a disabled veteran, I can say firsthand that they help hands down in everything that you can ask for, as far as getting in with the VA, uh, getting to and from, uh, getting to and from appointments if you don't have transportation, um, you need a job, they partner with Home Depot to help vets get jobs. Um, Right now, they've branched out to work with kids. Um, they started working with the Renzi Center here recently. Uh, they go with the Teen Club and the Lighthouse to provide after-school programs. Now that summer's getting ready to kick off here in the next month, they're gonna have all-day summer programs for those parents who don't have anywhere to put their kids while they're working all day, or they need somewhere their kids to go so they can have a break at the end of the day, um, or their kid is needs extra education or extra help or whatever it may be. They have an outlet for all of that. Um, with that being said, there goes single family homes, uh, single family, single parent, mother, father, you know, looking for a job, need assistance, trying to get a house, trying to get childcare. They help with that. They will go as far as getting rentals assistance, finding you the right landlord for you, um, paying a few months of utilities if need be. Um, helping you apply for food stamps, Medicaid, Medicare. Um, like I said, they really take care of it all. Um, they are the service for Highland, and not just Highland, but Northern Louisiana, like I said, parts of Central Louisiana, and I even think parts of Southern Arkansas, to be exact. Um, the Volunteers of America, I advise that if you know anybody that's a senior citizen, disabled vet, struggling single family, guide them there. Um, amazing. Uh, they work solely on donations, and the grant system from like places like Salvation Army and like I noted, like I noted earlier, Home Depot, people from the Highland community and Shreveport in general donate their own money just so they can do what they do. Um, and it's always a fresh face like every six months. They're changing out and they're getting qualified people. Not just anybody can work there. They do background checks extensively because they're a government entity at the end of the day. Um, so 
That's all I have. Thank you. I'm Kyla, like I said before, and my research type is the Renzi Education and Arts Center, which is an arts-based after-school program for K through 12 children. Um, it promotes child development and social interaction. So like this site is a large part of the Highland community and it has many deep-rooted values, beliefs, and traditions that contribute to it. Going into it, I had a lot of negative um, assumptions and expectations, but those have drastically changed since doing my research. Um, in regard to social interaction, the social environment that Renzi promotes is positive and it promotes positive social relationships as well by providing the same opportunity to students regardless of background. Um, so they have children that are homeschooled or from non-traditional schools, public, private, etc. Um, and they, they'll take in anyone from the shreveport Bossier area, but they predominantly focus on the Highland community. Um, and recently, the retention rates of the program have increased as the program finds ways to be more diverse. And uh, they also promote child development. So when I did my research, I did it through like active volunteering. And so there was a child that I was assisting with SMART and she was painting and she, they just had the primary colors to work with. And we were trying to show them how the color wheel can be expanded on. And she asked me, how do you make purple? And I was like, you mix red and blue, right? And then she was like, why? And that startled me because I hadn't seen childlike curiosity like that in a long time. But um, the Renzi Center helps to promote like an art-based education and after-school program through teaching life skills such as microwave cooking classes and gardening and art such as pottery and stop motion films as well as cartooning and then education through like computer skills such as Photoshop and Excel, as well as tutoring. Uh, the arts-based after-school programs effectively engage children, and especially low-income, high-crime children like that are from the Highland community. So kids that are from single-income homes tend to fall behind in school, and Renzi helps to bridge the gap. It shows kids that being smart doesn't mean like not being smart doesn't mean that you won't be successful and they find ways to show them that through creativity. So a child could do really well in a painting and then realize that they're really good at art even if they're not really good at math. So they help to promote self-confidence as well as self-esteem in children. And like I said before, the Renzi enables creative freedom um, in high cohesion communities where there's a lot of social interaction happening, children tend to develop um, fairly well and in communities such as Highland we tend to not see that as much but like I said Renzi bridges this gap they help kids to explore learning as well as creativity with professionals and overall have a more positive outlook on life as well as their successes later on Uh, hi, my name is Connor Lee, and I'm introducing the animals category. Uh, I did the cat doctor for my project, and my partner, Elliot Gill, who is not here right now, uh, had Shreveport Bossier Animal Rescue. <coughs> the cat doctor is a, it's a clinic that only works on cats, which makes it very unique and effective, which is why it's known as to be the best vet in the community. <coughs> Initially, I thought the vet clinic would be very scary and a negative place since they're portrayed pretty poorly in cartoons and movies, but they're actually very friendly and comfortable. Developments throughout the project was that I began to like cats a lot more. <laughs> and uh, I realized how big of a role they play in this community since Highland is a huge cat community because you always see cats everywhere. <laughs> And uh, so yeah, with all the cats roaming around the streets and out here and all the pets that they have, it's obviously the clinic plays a huge role in the community. Hello, I'm Gage Barber and I'm, I'm representing the parks with my partner Alyssa Fife. We were assigned 
Highland Park and Columbia Park. I was assigned uh, Highland Park, and going into it, I was pretty excited because um, parks are like a place to get away from like, like the noise of like the neighborhood, and if you want to go relax somewhere, um, I expected it to be like green and with like lively action and some people there. So when I first walked in there, I kind of laughed a little bit because I wasn't sure if this was a park I was supposed to be at because there was really nobody there and the grass wasn't wasn't green, it was brown because it's been raining for the past like week and a half and it was raining when I got there. So there was nobody there the first time I went. <clears throat> so I had to go again and then I had to go again. And then I finally, <laughs> and then I, I finally saw one person and, <clears throat> and he was a police officer and so I said, what the heck, I have to do it. So I went over there and I, and I talked to him and he said that he's been working there for actually quite a while and he's been stationed at the at the park to like, he's kind of like, like a good area to, like if he wants to get calls or anything. Um, and he didn't really help much besides saying that it's like, uh, it's a better place to go if it's during the summer. <laughs> but he did say that there were dogs on the roof, which is kind of <laughs> probably the most interesting I got thing out of him um and then and then I went again and I found uh I found a family of three and this was like the only sunny day throughout these three weeks of researching um they said that they usually go after school but because there was nobody um there to walk them since it was raining they had to take their cars that they hadn't been there in like a long time but they said that they it's a really nice park but it's not such a cloudy or rainy day um so after that, I actually, I did my secondary research and found that there's, um, there's this voluntary group called the Highland Story Project. I mean, that's our project. That's, that's my group. Sorry. Um, the Highland Park Project, which is a group of people who are there to kind of bring the park back together of, of what it used to be, because it, it, like, like it really has this falling apart. Um, like the playground was like really rusty and small and old and like there's a bunch of landslides and the trees are all cut. They're cut down so they can stop the landslides but it's not really working and the paths were all were all made of mud and so what they did is, is that they paved the they paved the paths. Um, so they paved, they paved the paths of Highland which is a really cool thing because a lot of people walk around Highland so it's just like a little cut through if you, if, if you want to cut through the park um, and after hearing about the paving I, I wanted to go check it out since the last time I've been it was the best experience and I met this man named Paul he was a disc golfer I don't know if I mentioned but there's disc golf there which is really interesting sports like golf but it's you throw it because there's discs into a chain net um, okay, he says he goes there three times a month when it's not raining um, <laughs> Um, so I'm really looking forward to going during the summertime when the trees are bloomed and the grass is green and the mud's not there anymore. So that's going to be interesting. I probably might go sooner or later. Um, so I'm going to pass this off to Columbia Park and what's the five? So as Gage said, my name is Alyssa Fife, and my chosen research site was Columbia Park. Now before I began this research and before I came to Centenary in general, I grew up in Bossier City for the majority of my life. Growing up in what you can consider to be the other side of town, I never heard positive things about the Highland area. All I ever heard about was the crime rate, the drug activity, things like that. And so when I came up here, those comments were constantly and consistently in the back of my head and I found myself having no appreciation for the area of Shreveport I found myself in. However, after this project, that opinion has been largely transformed, and I stopped seeing it as their perspective of their homes, but just as their stories of our home. So while I was at my research site, I did discover several folklore elements, such as tradition, childhood experiences, nature, so many others. But why exactly does this matter? Why is Columbia Park important to the community? Well, the answer is essentially in the question community. Ultimately, Columbia Park is a spark used to ignite the togetherness that is so unique to the Highland area. It brings together poor, rich, black, white, anyone and everyone, and it gives us an environment to grow and develop in together. So why is this research important to me, to you, or to anyone? Well, it matters because it shows the danger of having that kind of outsider perspective. 
and it shows the wonder to be found if you choose to step away from that. It also shows the ugliness of assuming knowledge, and it shows the wonder of accumulating your own. And lastly, it shows the danger of believing in a single story, and it shows the enlightenment to be found if you choose to take the path to discover so many more, including your own. Thank you. Our expectations of the Highland neighborhood were not the most positive going in, but they were transformed by the insight we gained from interacting with the individuals and the communities at our sites. We found that Highland is a community with a rich culture that is defined and strengthened by its diversity, and without this project, we may have completely overlooked that. We would like to thank our neighborhood partners for the insight and hope of this project, which was inspired by the Neighborhood Story Project, a collaboration between the University of New Orleans and the neighborhood ethnographers in New Orleans. Thank you for your time and attention. We will now take questions.